Um, it's almost two, so we might as well get started. Hello, everyone. Um, my talk today is the 90s called and they want their websites back. We're going to be talking about the history of the evolution of the personal website, the technology that improved it over time, and how current website development, in my opinion, circled back around to the same feeling of how it was to have a website in the late 90s, early 2000s. So to start off, let me tell you a little bit about myself and the type of work that I do. My name is Rachel White. I'm on Twitter at OHO. I'm a technical evangelist at Datadog. And that basically means it's my job to build really fun and exciting demos to teach people about various technologies. Um, I like to refer to myself, even though it's cheesy, as a creative technologist outside of work, because I also have had artist residencies with places in New York where I live. And I also just like love using code as a medium to make art, whether that be like visualizations or video games and VR slash AR. So I'd like to show you one thing in my previous work to sort of give you an idea of where I'm coming from when I create new projects or talks and why I'm motivated to share these things in a conference setting. So this is RoboKitty. RoboKitty was my first Node.js project and my first hardware project and my first conference talk because I'm a horrible person and submits conference talks before I finish the work. So I was like, well, I don't have to build it unless I get accepted. And then it got accepted and I had to build it. So I had to figure it out. Um, and for this project, I used a particle photon connected to a continuous servo that I glued to the dispenser handle of a serial dispenser. So when I demoed it as like an intro to NodeBots, we just filled it with candy and it would just dump candy everywhere at conferences. Um, you basically go to the website, push a button, and then it would dispense whatever is inside the device. It was a really simple project and the talks that I gave on it basically detailed the struggle that I had when trying to learn something completely new and also probably the most detailed readme that I've ever written in my life. So if anybody wanted to try it, even if they weren't necessarily programmers, they could probably follow along and get the gist of what's, go of what's going on. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, I'd like to take everything I do and present it in a way that even if you're not a developer, you will get instructions in a way that will empower you to give it a try so that there's not really a barrier to entry. And that brings us to our history lesson, the history of the early-ish internet. So like the, talk of, the title of this talk references the 90s, that's where we're going back to. We've got to go back about 25, 26 years to start to begin speaking about the kind of self-expression on the internet that I'm talking about via personal websites. And yes, there were people expressing themselves in the 80s and early 90s as well. We're not really going to talk about Usenet or BBSs or anything. We're talking about the history of the personal site, the definition of online expression in the late 90s, we're talking about GeoCities and Angel Fire. So, GeoCities was created in 1994 as a web hosting service, originally initiated as a beta program called Beverly Hills Internet. The concept was to create cyber cities in which users would select a virtual city where they wanted their website to be categorized under. There were neighborhoods such as Area 51 for science fiction or fantasy or Rodeo Drive for people that love shopping and fashion. And people would select these neighborhoods based on whatever their interests were and could either create a fan site related to the neighborhood or just their own personal site that could be found in those sections so that they could find people with like-minded interests. Angel Fire was created in 1996 as a web hosting site and medical transcription service. And they really quickly dropped the transcription as soon as they started seeing the success of the hosting and how GeoCities was taking off. And while GeoCities had the neighborhood feature for selecting your own domain area, Angel Fire primarily focused on hobbies instead. So your domain name would appear as www.angelfire.com with two more names or directories after it. Uh, and then you would select them from a pull down menu. So your first directory would be based on your state or interest like New York or Pokemon. And then you would enter the text that you want for the second directory. And the key thing that GeoCities and Angel Fire provided to consumers was a very straightforward and understandable way to get a website up and running. Um, I'm not a fan of generally using words like easy or simple to describe technology, but 
there's not really any other way that I could explain it. They made it that accessible to users. Um, they both had simple control panels where you would be able to ed edit HTML files in some kind of text box. Coupled with the simple editors, you would be able to grab animated GIFs from places and add those to give your sites some more personality. The whole process was extremely streamlined, and in, even if you didn't know how to write HTML, there were tons of sites online, like I believe Dynamic Drive was one of the places that had a lot of GeoCities and AngelFire stuff that you could just copy and paste to get whatever you need. Um, if you wanted to be a little bit more code savvy, you also had the option to use FTP, but it was still largely the same, simple static HTML images and you were good to go. There were a lot of little communi communities that popped up to give you cop and paste, copy and paste snippets to add to your site for things like making it snow on your page, having silly website cursors, or any other small JavaScript uh, effects. And nobody was really using copy and paste code as like a derogative terminology then. It was just like encouraged and everyone was helping each other and it was really fun. So I have a couple examples of these early websites and why I love talking about them. Often when I'm speaking about old GeoCities or Angel Fire sites and I'm looking for images to use, uh, you stumble on a lot of old screenshots and it feels really personal, like you stumbled on somebody's diary and you're not supposed to read it, even though you know they put it on the web. So the first one that I want to show you is Stephanie's Temple of Cool. She has a Hanson fan page, a Joe McIntyre fan page, he's from New Kids on the Block, as well as a fine guy shrine. Uh, she also includes a link page with which many people used before web rings got super popular and they just used, you know, as a link page to link to friend sites, other fan sites, or other resources to get cool things for your own page. My next example is just called a cute boy site and says, this is a place for girls, but if boys want to see pictures of boys too, I don't mind and that's great. <laughs> And after the intro, they say, I hope your eyes are going to have a great time, which, you know, I, I just love this site. People were also making sites about sharing information, so teaching people how to create their own Doom levels, tons of websites about, like, Game Genie cheat codes, things that, uh, you know, people didn't want to pay for official Prima strategy guides, so they would help you out there. You don't have to watch, like, a whole video like you do now. It was just all in one place. And then my personal favorite, the Jerry the Cat homepage. Uh, this was built in the Pittsburgh neighborhood on GeoCities. Jerry's, Jerry the Cat's owners wrote a lot of dialogue about the life of Jerry, such as, the reason Jerry is so fat is because he can scalp food from anyone. If possible, he would gladly consume five or six normal meals. There's only one reason for this. He was raised by countless admirers who could not help but constantly feed his seemingly helpless butt. Affectionately known as Fat Boy, Jerry used to follow me down the street at night, almost three kilometers. If I would run, he would run. If I would hide, he would look for me. Once I sent him home from a friend's place only to have him come jumping through the window, which was at the back of the house about 10 minutes later. And lastly, this snippet. Here's Jerry in the hands of his humble owner. It's kind of refreshing to know sometimes that he remembers. He's a cool cat, but doesn't particularly like to be touched. And pats are always welcomed, but only for a limited period. Who knows what goes on inside the mind of Jerry? I think this is a perfect example of how people would use these sites. They would make sites for, you know, whatever reason they wanted. And who knows how many people would see it or how they would discover it. Perhaps it's just something that you shared with your friends and family. But also the way that the neighborhoods were set up on GeoCities made it so that you could explore the sites that were in sections near yours. So at the very bottom of the Jerry the Cat page, it has a visitor counter and ends. For a great listing of websites dedicated to animals slash pets, then you know you want to go to Pittsburgh Station. Some really great sites created by animal lovers all around the world. So being able to stumble back on these is endearing and inspiring to me as it reminds me of a time when the internet was just generally a little bit nicer. Um, and after this, as we move into the 2000s, people were craving a little bit more in terms of customization. And luckily, technology was growing to meet the demand of self-expression. So in the early 2000s, a lot of things started happening that enabled that desire for more customization. Uh, social media started, specifically speaking, MySpace in 2003. MySpace also allowed users to use HTML and images to be able to customize your profile right there on the site. Just like the GeoCities and AngelFire resources, communities also sprung up to help people deck out their profiles with custom designs. 
as well as some secret code that will let you see who is viewing your profile, which if you were a teenager, you absolutely added and would check furiously to see if your crush was looking at your MySpace profile. And then in addition to MySpace, Neopets, which was founded in 1999, started gaining popularity in the early 2000s as well. And many people today still talk about Neopets and MySpace as being their first attempt at writing HTML and CSS. And the key with MySpace and Neopets is that it was also a one-stop editor. You didn't have to take any additional steps. You would just edit it in that text box, hit save, and the changes would immediately be reflected. And then on the personal website side, we had something else happening in the early 2000s. In November 2000, a blogging software named Gray Matter was created by Noah Gray. Um, it's referred to alongside Cafe Log as being the inspiration for WordPress. Gray Matter was maintained by Noah for about two years and then taken over by a community of supporters. And during that time, it allowed for more people to register their own domain names and learn how to work with cPanel and do some server configuration. It didn't require a database, and the only requirement was that the web server had to support Perl. It also allowed people to have much more control over their content. I've actually spoken about this specific part of website history at length, and if you want to hear more about that, there's a Medium article I wrote called Keep the Internet Weird, and there's also a recording of a talk I gave at JS Comp EU with the same title. Since the early 2000s, the style of the personal site hasn't really changed that much. You've typically got an about page, maybe a blog, and a few other pages for information about yourself, but the technologies have grown exponentially, and so has the barrier to entry. Content management systems like WordPress, Drupal, Joomla dominated the rest of the 2000s. If companies weren't using these technologies, they were rolling out their own custom MVCs. You had to start worrying about templating for your layouts, databases to store your content. It wasn't as simple to just click and go as a user who wanted to play around with the code. Around 2010, we started seeing a lot more heavy emphasis on design and design systems when it comes to front end, as well as a shift from PHP and Java over to JavaScript. We're caring more about actually like knowing stacks and you know, not just getting up and running quickly. Which is why for the 2010s, I'm describing it best as design in JavaScript times 1,000. The market just like entirely gets saturated with JavaScript in various frameworks and libraries. Node.js in 2009, subsequently Express in 2010, Angular in 2010, Backbone in 2010, Ember in 2011, and React in 2013. And they were all at once a lot of different ways for you to accomplish you know, the same idea. And this led to a lot of burden of choice and a lot of documentation to read to just get up and running. And that's just the beginning of it. Now we also have to worry about like how we are going to write our CSS um, or how we're going to have a design system. Paul Irish released the HTML5 boilerplate in 2010, which was a starting template for HTML and CSS, had a lot of browser resets in it. And we've also got things like SAS and LESS, which are scripting languages that are compiled into CSS to worry about as well. And even more CSS libraries for various things such as Tachyons, Bulma, Tailwind Foundation, Pure, Spectre, Milligram, Base, Google Material Design. So no matter the thing that you're trying to accomplish, there's now numerous ways of trying to do it. So what are you supposed to do? And what are you supposed to do if you're a person who's not like super technical? So sure, we obviously can't really go back to how easy things were in the 90s, but we can go back to static sites and a more simple and streamlined developer experience. So say hello to the Jamstack if you're not familiar with that terminology. It stands for JavaScript, APIs, and Markup, and it's really popular. Um, Jamstack works by decoupling the front end from the back end. So before deployment, the entire front end is pre-built into highly optimized static pages and assets. And this happens in a build process. Um, you can pick and choose your own technologies. Simplify the steps that it takes from you to writing your code for it to showing up on the web. And that's why I personally love it whenever I need to get anything up and running because it reminds me of how easy it was when I was a teenager just really needing to get my like pop punk or wrestling fan site out the door. So here are some of the more popular approaches to Jamstack style development. You've got Next.js, which is a minim minimalistic framework for server rendered React applications as well as statically exported React apps. <clears throat> Hugo, which is a static site generator written in Go. Gatsby, which is another framework that allows you to create more minimal and fast React applications, which are also exported as static files. And you can see a lot more at jamstack.org generators. 
And I know what you're thinking. Um, I just showed you a lot of other technologies talking about burden of choice, and now I'm showing you more. Um, this is a little bit different because you don't have to worry about the server or a ton of configurations. You don't really have to know the full stack up and down. They make it more simple for you to get up and running. And hosting platforms like Netlify and Vercel make this process even easier. You just hook up your Git repository, and upon pushing to your main branch, it kicks off the static site generation based off of whatever tool you're using. And you don't have to worry about servers, CI, CD, or CDNs anymore, unless you like really want to, I guess. Um, you just write your code, and you're good to go. So I had an idea in my head for a really long time that I was kicking around during the start of the pandemic. And I knew that the Jamstack approach was the right way to go. So let me tell you what the project was, how I accomplished this, and how you can get started. So um, I've been to Japan a few times, and one of my favorite things to do when I'm there is to do photo booths called Purikura. In Japan, it refers to a photo sticker booth or the product of such a photo booth. The name is a shortened form of the registered trademark. Put in, I'm going to butcher this. Purinto Kurabu. <laughs> so, you know, like the katakana for a print club. The term derives from the English Print Club, and it was invented in 1994 by Sasaki Miho, who works for Atlas Games. Atlas was later bought by Sega in 1995, and they released the first Purikura booths, mostly in arcades. You can now find them all over arcades, bowling alleys, karaoke places, and other entertainment centers. Round One is a popular Japanese amusement company that has started like opening locations all over the United States adjacent to large cities. So if you want to try one of these, that's probably your best bet. So the booths have three separate areas. The first one is where you take photos in front of the green screen. There's these little cubbies where you can put your things and a screen which gives you pose suggestions and countdown timers for when your photo will be taken. Some of the booths have full body images, but they're not all like that. Um, but if the, they do have full body images, they, they make you look real weird. Like your legs are like super long because they're like tilting it and trying to make everybody look skinny. It's strange. It also makes you look like a giraffe sometimes. Um, once you're done taking your photos, you move to the next section, which is the decorating part. And the decorate part of the booth has a touch screen with pens that allow you to move through each photo that you took and add stickers, text decorations, frames, as well as add makeup and make adjustments to the photos as if you were on Instagram or any other photo editing app. And once you're done, you move to the last part, which is outside of the booth where the photos print out. So I knew that I wanted to recreate this experience, but how was I going to be able to capture that in a COVID world where I can't hang out with my friends right now? So I made Purry Booth. Um, Purry Booth is a React application generated into static assets, utilizing WebAssembly for ultra-fast image filtering and Canvas for photo decorating. It's hosted on Netlify, so anytime I push changes to my main GitHub repository, the build automatically kicks off and everything is generated and deployed so I don't have to worry about a thing, unless there's an error, but we're gonna ignore errors. Um, I'm also using Datadog's real user monitoring, so I'm able to track what my users are doing because I'm not using any routing. Everything is a single, single URL, so I need to know like what behavior is going on, um, and I'm able to use those metrics to improve my user experience. So let me give you a demo. Um, it's been a very long time since I've had to do this backwards, so please bear with me. All right, view, exit, full screen. All right, so we'll make you big a little. This is Prairie Booth. Um, it's obviously like Windows 95 inspired. It works on mobile as well. At least it did last time I checked. So the way that it works is you click Let's Get Started and you can either upload a photo or use your webcam. We're gonna upload a photo and go to my favorite, Nicholas Cage. So once you got the photo that you wanna use, you're ready to go to the next section, which is filters. And this is using um, the WebAssembly library that I'll tell you about in a second. There's a ton of fun options and you can see it's like super fast. Um, let's go with perfume because it's cute. And then you move to the decorating page just like you do in the other photo booths. And I drew some of these and then I commissioned some of my friends to also draw them. And this is utilizing Canvas and you can resize and rotate all of the images. You can also um, remove them if you want to and use some Z-index stuff with send to back. 
Uh, let's add some cute little squiggles and some cute stars and a nice border. Cute, right? He's never looked better. So then you click Let's Share, and it just saves it into an image that you can then put on social media or save and share with your friends, which, you know, it's, it's obviously not exactly the same thing, but it gets you pretty close, and it's fun. So let's go back to the other tab. Is this gonna start it over? No, okay, good. All right, let me get my mouse back. Let me get my other stuff back. Oh no, where did that go? Oh, I know what happened. Sorry, I lost my presenter slides. Oh my goodness. Sorry, this is like the first time I've given a talk in person in two years and I forgot how computers work, apparently. Ah. Okay, I know what I need to do. Thank you for being patient. All right, there we go. Now you come back and go full screen. All right, there we go. All right, so now let's get into the technical details. Uh, I knew I needed a simple React app, and that all my components were going to be React hooks. It's a single page application. There's no routing involved either. So to start off this project, I use something called React App Rewired. It lets you tweak the Create React App Webpack configs without using eject and without creating a fork of React scripts. It's got all the benefits of Create React App without the limitations of no config, and you can add plugins, loaders, whatever you need. Um, and we did need some loaders for our image manipulation, which I'll get into next. I did have a picture of Giuseppe on here. <laughs> so um, I have a lot of experience with JavaScript image manipulation libraries, and one popular one that I've used before is a library called Image Magic. And to put it lightly, um, it's terrible. Uh, it's finicky, it's slow, it's not fun. I told myself I was never gonna use it again. Um, it's, it's just not a good experience. And yeah, there's some other JavaScript libraries you can use to do your image manipulation, such as GIMP, CommonJS, Pika, Lena, or Compressor, but I decided to go a different route. And that route is a library called Photon. It's an image processing library in WebAssembly that runs both natively and on the web. And I chose Photon because it's four to 10 times faster than JavaScript. And when I accidentally found it, the person that created it was very helpful. So if I got stuck on anything, they were actually helping me. Um, it also has over 90 functions built in already, including some filters, channel and color manipulation, resizing and correction. So it took a lot of the heavy photo manipulation work out of the way. Um, there was also a quick start for Node.js, so I was able to grab the package and easily adapt it to the drop-down filtering that I implemented. And the configuration override that you need for the WebAssembly to work with React was also in the Photon repository, so I didn't have to overthink that part either. Um, and finally, the last thing, which is arguably the most important part of the whole entire project, was the sticker decorations. Um, it was also the most difficult. Uh, whenever you're dealing with canvas elements, there's a ton of libraries that people have made that are really finicky for like specific use cases. And writing from everything, everything from scratch is a fair amount of work and I'm really lazy, so I'd rather not do that. <laughs> Um, so I found a library called Fabric.js, which seemed to fit all of the things that I needed. Um, if it didn't, I found some uh, gists where people were like trying to get some behavior uh, similar to mine that I was able to use. It allows you to have images on the canvas be resized, rotated, dragged around, and it also supports image grouping, so you're able to mass delete items if you want. And it also lets you move layers up and down like you're editing Z index with CSS. So now that I have all of the technical elements that I needed, it was time for me to deploy. And this is where the title of my talk comes from. I missed that simplicity of being able to just, you know, edit in one place and have my site ready to go. And Netlify made the process just as easy as it had been when I would 
edit something in a text box and hit save. It's the same amount of steps, essentially, after setup. So I was already using GitHub for my repo, so here's what I did. I signed up for an account at Netlify, set up my domain to point to their servers, and then in build and deploy, I set up my GitHub repository with a build command, and the directory to be published um, is the one that has the static site files once it's built, and that's it. Now, every time that I push to my main branch, Netlify knows, it kicks off the build and deploy process, and I don't need to go to multiple sites. I don't even really need to leave my code editor or command line environment. It's very convenient. Um, I did run into some issues once I started having friends and family testing the site, though. When I started letting people try it out, I was noticing some errors that were happening only on mobile. And I was also noticing some people were clicking or uh, pressing on the images like on mobile and others were like expecting to drag it. Um, and the things that my friends and family were telling me that they were having issues with were easy enough for me to implement, but it would have been easier to foresee these things if I had a bigger picture view of interactivity. So that's when I decided to add some monitoring to the site to track user behavior and it was super straightforward. So Datadog offers something called real user monitoring and you don't need to have access to a back end to be able to get insight into what's really happening on the front end, which is great. Um, it's only a couple lines of code in my index.js file, and I decided to add in a few custom user actions to know a bit more about what people were doing, so like what filters they were using the most and what stickers were getting used the most and whether or not my user's behavior was like dragging or clicking. And the custom user action snippet looks like the one on the right, and I had that added in for each of those things that I mentioned that I wanted to track. Um, I pushed this up to my main branch, had people start testing again, and I had uh, then take a look at the dashboard that I created. So now I had all of the information in one place, what filters people were using, what stickers were most popular, as well as latency info, how long people were staying on the site. If they were abandoning a certain step in the process, I would know based off of the buttons that they were clicking on, even though I didn't have you know, the routing implemented. So I'm able to then like go in and be like, okay, cool, people aren't really using these stickers, so I can remove them, so I have a little bit of a faster load time whenever people go to the site. And, optimizations like that. And yeah, so I guess to summarize, I know that the 90s are back in style right now, and um, it's also easier than ever to get your own personal site up and running, and you don't need to worry about all of that extra stuff that you want to need to do for configuring, you know, complicated servers and other stacks. You can just have the simplicity of doing it all in one place. And if you'd like to see the code for this project, it's at github.com slash Rachel Nicole slash Prairie Booth. Um, thank you.